everybody, CW here. Let's look at some six arcs that we shot this weekend and talk about the case forming loads and the cases that I made out of 762 by 39. Here's what we got. I shot quite a bit. This is the first firings of the gun and this is all the brass that was fired in it. So we've got I didn't even count it all. Let's see here. We got 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 35, 40, 45, 50, 55, 60, 65, 67, 69, 72 pieces of brass. So that's how many rounds are through the gun. And of those, most of them were fire forming loads. Um, those two racks in the back are Federal and PMC. Yeah, Federal Brass and PMC Brass. And then there's a little bit of factory stuff here, and there's a little bit of Starline, um, you know, brand new cases. Um, and then these three were, I don't know how I got them. I got, there's a Herders in here. There's one Herders, one 1K, and one IMI, 762 by 39. They somehow got mixed in and fire formed. No, no big deal. So I brought them home and I immediately deprimed everything and I cleaned everything, threw it all in the tumbler while we were on uh, Scotsman's chat last night. And uh, when that was done, the chat was done, it was a couple hours, so I took them out of the tumbler and then I annealed everything. So everything here is all annealed. Let me see if I can get you zoomed in so you can see a little better. It's all annealed brass. I've been doing it a little bit different and I've been really liking the effects and that is to wash them, tumble them, and then anneal them while they're still wet. Uh, what I find is Usually my kneeling times run mm, six to eight seconds. And it varies greatly for the size of the brass and the size of the neck and, you know, the, the, the diameter. But basically that's where it usually falls. Sometimes as long as, as nine or ten seconds, but generally it's seven. Well, these all required 12, even 15 on some. Now, I granted... You know, as soon as you start changing manufacturers, things change because brass is not brass. It's all brass, but it may be a little more nickel, maybe a little more this, a little more that. Who knows exactly the composition that each company uses for their brass? Because it, it doesn't have to be, you know, it isn't all exactly the same. Um, like, you know, you may know, we've probably all experienced stainless steel, and we all know stainless steel doesn't rust. Well, do you know there's, there, manufacturing is allowed to label things as stainless steel if they have a certain percentage of stainless steel in them. They don't, they're not required to say this is 20% stainless steel. If it's got stainless steel in it, they're allowed to, if it's got so uh, enough, they're allowed to say it's stainless steel. And we've all seen some stainless steels that rust and other stainless steels that are impervious to salt water I mean just incredible so that's what you've got going on with your brass um you know I think everybody knows that Lapua Peterson and a number of others are really good premium brass why are they better than others well part of it is quality control but also part of it is is what the brass is what the brass components are to make that piece of brass that create and make the case. Anyway, that's not what all this is about. So the reason for the variance is, like I say, from 12 to say 15 seconds, which is almost double normal. Partially is the difference in manufacturers because it's gonna vary. And the other is that they're wet. There's water in the cases. Now they're all deprimed, so, you know, in theory, the water will run out the flash hole or run out the case mouth, but they're wet and there is some semblance of water caught inside the case. So that water is going to dissipate heat 
faster than just the brass will if it's clean and dry. So that alone is causing for a little bit longer annealing times to get to the temperature that I like. And I like to anneal my brass until I get just just a dull glow. It's it's almost a, a straw color, a hay color. It's almost the brass color. But that's what I look for. And then I stop the annealing. If you get cherry red, you, you've gone too far and you could actually be hurting your brass. But, you know, if it just gets a gets a dull red glow, you're going to be okay. Um, but try not to go that far. You know, limit it to that. Just just beginning to get a dull red glow and then, and then stop. And you're, you're technically too far, but you're not, you haven't heard anything. Anyway, so I did all those and then I threw them all in the case dryer and went to bed. So I got this morning and everything's dry. So I've been a busy beaver, because that's not all I did. Here's a hundred, well, here's 20, but there's 30 over there. A hundred hammers. And here's 52 eight millimeter Mausers. And the eight millimeter Mausers also got annealed. So I've got another bucket here of two, two threes that just got cleaned. And a little bucket of 350 Legends that have already been cleaned and put away. But what we're going to do here is we're going to set up our die. And we're going to size some of this brass. And we're going to check it in the, in the rifle. What I experienced, um, again, remember, I loaded up all this ammo for the arc before I had the rifle. So I just did the old run the die into the press. Run your shell holder up until it just touches and you get just a little bit of cam over. And I called it good. Because that's that's the basic setup and that's how we all were taught and were learned to reload brass, reload cartridge cases, metallic cases um, in, in the beginning. Now we know we've got things like shoulder bump that we can watch and look for and that's a better way to set up your dies. The only stick in the mud to that is if you have multiple firearms of the same caliber, then you're going to have to change things and reset up your dies for each gun, unless you're lucky enough that that one setup will work with both or all of your firearms in that caliber. In my case, I only have one arc, so it's no big deal. We're using the Foster um, dies, and this is, what is this, a bench, bench rest? Yeah, this is a bench rest set. They have a couple different ones. And this is the one we just we just picked up. I really like their dies. I would say they're every bit on par with with the top end Reddings. Um, I would put them a little step above um, RCBSs, but uh, maybe a slight sidestep. Um, I think I think their components are nicer. You look at the way it's built. It's just just a little bit nicer. One feature that it's got that I really like is it's got a floating. Expander ball that's adjustable, and it's also not really a ball. It's a lot bigger than most, and you can turn this to adjust where you want it to be. I've got it turned all the way down, and yeah, there's some lube on there from lube and cases. Um, but what I found when I first was doing this, and when I was first forming the cases, if you watch that video, I was having some problems. And part of those problems were the position of that expander ball. Now, I solved it by removing it. But I still had some issues after that with loading. And what I found was I lengthened, I made the pin deeper, so I pushed this farther in the case, and I moved the expander ball down. See, what happens with the Grendel, I mean the Arc, it's such a short little case that when you're depriming, see, we're just about to pop that primer. The expander ball was in the neck. The expander ball was screwed all the way up, up high. So the expander ball was in the neck or just going in the neck as the primer was getting popped. And there was too many things going on at once, expanding the neck compressing the shoulder, moving back the shoulder, squeezing down the sides of the case, 
decapping the primer, forming the case neck. It's just too many things at once. So we eliminated this and we just sized the case. So we just did the neck and the diameter and we started having you know, less problems. Well, when I came back to do the necks, I did them on the mandrel, so I didn't have to worry about this. And it, and it was okay. But I wanted to be able to use this too to see if there was a difference and to make just things easier. So I found that by lengthening this pin, you know, pushing it down in farther so that it goes into the case more, you know, because you got you can push it down about that far. So see how much case pin is sticking out the bottom of the case? You can do that without a problem. You just don't want this this crashing into the bottom inside of your case because that would be bad. You'll bend your rod, you'll have problems. But you've got, you know, all this latitude. Well, let's see, probably there to there room that this could be screwed in or out of the die and it's going to be perfectly fine. But because the case is so short, I found that I had to push this down farther to get this expander ball into the case out of the picture. Ideally, I would have liked it up here so that we go in and then do it last, but it just didn't work that way. So that solved a lot of the problems. And you don't get that adjustment in everybody's dies. You know, most places, the expander ball is attached to your is attached to your uh, decapping pin nut that holds the nut in. All right. So we've talked a lot. I've got 10 minutes in of yabbering, and I haven't even gotten to what this video is about. So we've got our, our shoulder measuring tool here. And I've gone to the liberty of already setting this at zero and checking the average. Hopefully you can see that. I can't read it, but hopefully you can. So I've got 12 cases here. These happen to be Hornady's. And they happen to be the ones that Wes sent us. Um, Alabama Reloader. So I don't know their history. I don't know how many times they've been loaded. But I did find something interesting. And I thought maybe I was having some pressure issues. I'm going to get behind the camera here and hopefully I don't screw you up too much. Um, let's look at these case heads. See all those shiny spots? Now, especially this one over here. Right above the C, from the, between the R and the C and to the Y and Hornady, is a really shiny spot. Now, this is a bolt action. So you're not going to see drags like you see on AR actions. But there is drags on here. So I got to assume that this came from previous firings and these were fired in an AR because obviously a bolt action, although it does have a rotating bolt, you're doing it manually and you're not doing it when the cartridge is at peak pressure. See right there through the Hornady? That's a drag. So it, you know, it, it shows pressures. These two cartridges here had serious, serious raised areas. Serious raised. So much so that I drug them across a stone just to take the burrs off because I couldn't measure them. See that huge shiny spot there across six millimeter? That's all an extractor or a ejector drag. No real extractor marks per se and no deformation you know everything is nicely shaped so i don't see any issues there but wow now the other thing that i haven't talked to him about yet but i annealed these last night but they were also already annealed when i got them and something about annealing that you guys should know from previous videos but i'll tell you again anyway you only want to anneal. I've got bad lighting here. You only want to anneal your neck and your shoulder. That's that's all you want to anneal. You do not want that heat to get down here into the case head. 
if that heat gets down here into the case head, you're going to soften up your case heads and you're going to find stuff like this before you actually reach pressure. So I don't know if possibly somebody else annealed these. I think Wes knows this, so it shouldn't be him, but maybe somebody else, maybe got this from somebody else and they didn't know and they didn't anneal this properly and they actually softened the case heads and that's what caused that to happen. I don't know. Unknown history of this brass. So we're going to not use this for our best favorite loads. We're not going to use this brass for accuracy proving or ladder loads or anything. This is just going to be range brass. Actually, I'll probably mark it. I've got some dicum that will permanently mark these. And I'll use them for my cast bullet loads. I'm going to play around with cast bullets and the, su and the suppressor um, with some 100 grain cast bullets that I have. Just, just for fun. Just for yard, yard, you know, yard work, garden, stuff like that. But I wanted to show it to you because it's a little bit alarming to see it. Now here's, here's brand new Starline brass. Once fired in my gun. And obviously there's nothing there because, well... <laughs> I know the history of this brass. I know what it was loaded to. Start, start looking at all this 762 brass, and we get the same story. We start getting marks. You know, there's a big, big hickey there. What the heck that is? I don't know. And there's shiny spots. That one's not awful. There's a little bit over there. But again, we don't know the history of this brass. We don't know if this was fired in an AK or an SKS or. Who knows what and who knows how many times they appeared to be once fired, but I don't know. So again, this is going to be just range brass, just front brass. It's not going to be used for, you know, ultimate precision, accuracy, proving loads, anything like that. We'll save our brand new stuff for that. And I'll probably get in some really good brass down the road. Um, I want to play with Lapua for the Grendel, and I'll probably get some for this as well, just for, you know, ultimate best loads I can make type of stuff. And we'll go from there. So, all right. So, again, I've clocked another five minutes here. And I'm going to have a 25-minute video and I don't want one. So, let's set up our die. We got a special sized Allen wrench for the Foster dies. So, we're going to back this off. Of course, I'm on video and I can't get the wrench to fit in. We're going to back this off so that this turns. We're going to run this all the way up. Run this up out of the way. Run this down till we touch the die. That's about where we're going to start. Because we don't want to get off in the left field to start with. So we're just going to go until it just touches. Now again, we've already checked this brass and we know it's set at zero. So let's just put just a little bit of lube. Am I still zoomed in? Yes, I am. Sorry about that. Put just a little bit of lube on here. A little bit inside the case mouth, but I'm not overly worried about that. Run this up inside the die. And out. You don't have to wipe it off every time. We're going to probably size it a few times. But I don't like to get the grease sizing lube all over everything, so I'll remove it. Come back on our tool here and let's see if we made any movement if we touched that shoulder at all and we did but we did it the other way we actually made it longer and why did it come out longer anybody know the answer how can you get it longer you ran it into a die it should make it smaller how did it get bigger well the case neck the expander ball pulled on the the case neck enough to lengthen the shoulder how much one thousandth of an inch see it there I'll zoom in a little bit we were at zero now it's showing 15 <coughs> five eh. so half a thousand so thousands to half a thousand so say 75 and it happened because the expander ball pulled on the case neck and lengthen the shoulder by that much. So we got to go a little bit more. So let's just take this case and set it aside. 
and take another one. First, let's go in a little bit with our reloading die, lock it down, take a new piece of brass. Again, out of the 12 that we checked, put some lube on the outside. A little bit of lube rubbed off my finger out of the case mouth. Run it up in here and down. I like to give it a second. Brass will um, rebound. So if you give it a second, sometimes you get a little better, more consistent results. Slow things down a little. All right, let's try this one. And this one here, see that little bit of movement? Four thousandths of an inch, three and a half to four thousandths of an inch. That's about what we want for shoulder bump. And that's that little bitty bump, little bitty bump that I did. Now let me show you here. I'm gonna, I'm gonna pull this back. It goes back to zero. Past zero to eighty-five, minus four, back to zero ten. So that's longer. See that's room. Push it up here so it's tight. There's no room. Four. Three places. Zero, 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 four. So that's four and a half thousand shoulder bump that we just put on that case. That's about what we want. Now let's take this real quick and run it in the gun. 21 minutes. I wanted to take like a 15 minute video. Again, any, any YouTube sensors... Any people out there who don't know firearms, this is an empty case. I'm in a controlled environment. It's safe where I am. I am running an empty case, not a loaded piece of ammo, into the gun. Now, that it won't feed, so you got to put it in the chamber. And then remember, you have to snap your extractor over top of the rim before it'll close. But there it goes. Goes right in, no problem. Closes nice and smooth. Right in and closes nice and smooth. There we go. So there we go. That's how I set it up. Brand new brass. Brand new everything. I'm sorry. Brand new rifle. Brand new setup. So now what we're going to do, we have to very carefully hold this in position so that it doesn't move on us and tighten up this screw. Now if we tighten it up here a little bit, we might be able to get away with some, but ideally you want to loosen it because you're pinching everything together. You put force on it up and then you tighten this down and then you squeeze this here. You could be tensioning all the threads so that this doesn't come off. Okay, I got it. So I turn it around here and I grabbed everything. So everything turned in one. Tighten this up. You don't have to be Hercules. You just want to make sure it's not going to move on you because this is a permanent setting now the one thing i don't like on forester dies and i do change them sometimes is i like to get the wrench flats because i feel you know i can do this and i'm I, you know it's on there good but if i put a wrench on it i can get the setting the torque setting more consistent with a wrench than i can with my hands that's just me you know, it's, it's on there good. I like it to be torqued just a little bit so I can get more consistent, but that's just me. But there we go. I'm going to cut this short. You don't need to see me size all the rest of these. Just a quick setup. We talked about what kind of marks we saw on our brass and why. And I'm going to go through these and resize them all and get them ready for loading. Stay tuned for the next video. A lot more coming on the arc. God bless everybody. CW out.